Now, I've given a lot of speeches, but I must say I am so moved. Forgive me if I am finding it difficult to express my appreciation. This really is special to me. First, I want to thank Ambassador Haspels for your kind introduction. Please convey my deep appreciation for this award to your government in The Hague and to the members of the advisory committee. I am humbled and extremely grateful to be selected for this honor. Thank you to my longtime colleagues. Now, I know Debbie Wasserman Schultz was involved because she, she couldn't be here today. I think she was tied up, but she led the 2014 initiative to plant saplings on the Capitol grounds in Washington, which were taken from the chestnut tree by the secret annex to Anne Frank's home in Amsterdam. And she herself is a strong leader of efforts to combat anti-Semitism in the United States and abroad. Ted Deutsch. <laughs> We've been friendly for so long, and I am such an admirer. And I'm so glad you're here to carry on the fight you have been so articulate and strong in every issue that I know we share. So I thank you, thank you so much for your kind words. What do I say about Kay Granger? Oh my goodness. Kay Granger, whether she's chair or an I'm chair, really doesn't matter because we have all worked together and I really appreciate your generous remarks. I thank you so very much. I also want to express my deep appreciation to Advisory Committee member Katrina Lantos-Sweat, the daughter of my late friend and colleague, Congressman Tom Lantos, the only Holocaust survivor to serve in Congress who rose to become chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and was a leading voice internationally for human rights. There are so many people in this room that I want to thank. <laughs> my staff, my friends, my supporters, but I'm going to go on with my remarks, and if I forget you, I'll catch up at the end. So here we are in 2021. To be among so many friends this morning is really an honor. With COVID protocols and restricted travel, I frankly haven't seen many of you since leaving Washington. I admit, by the time I retired from the Congress after 32 years, I really had hoped that fighting the scourge of anti-Semitism would be a thing of the past. The challenges we face today are as pressing and virulent as ever before. The blood-curdling cries from neo-Nazi groups in Charlottesville of take back our country and Jews will not replace us still echo in our ears. Spray-painted swastikas on the doors of synagogues in Europe and the United States and shouts of Hitler was right are burned into our minds. 
and the cold-blooded murders of Jews in Paris and Pittsburgh will forever break our hearts. Last year marked 75 years since Anne Frank's life was extinguished by those who sought to rid the world of an entire people. We have committed ourselves to the phrase, never again. And yet, even in the United States, many of today's millennials and young people display a horrifying lack of knowledge or even awareness of the Holocaust. Just a few weeks ago, we read in shock about a teachers' meeting in Texas where educators, those responsible for teaching children, were debating whether they should be presenting opposing views of the Holocaust. opposing views of the Holocaust. Well, we call those opposing views lies. Tragically, we are now living at a time where lives have been given the currency of opposing views, where some elected leaders and influencers in the media have launched a calculated and strategic war on truth. This, my colleagues, is perhaps the most dangerous threat today to all of us today. It harkens back to the despicable canard of blood libel, the calculated lie used to justify violence against Jews around the world for centuries. Most all hatred is rooted in lies. I do believe that the fight for truth and a shared belief in our collective humanity are the single most important challenges we face today. When we deny the humanity of any group of people, we threaten the humanity and safety of all. That principle is at the core of how I have tried to live my life and has guided me during my 32 years in Congress. I had to smile for that because what an honor it has been for me to serve in the Congress. What an honor it has been for me to know my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, so many friends who were part of helping me, especially my wonderful staff. I would have them stand up and wave to you. Um, but this was really a team effort. And human rights and dignity for all people, regardless of religion, gender, ethnicity, nationality, or sexual orientation. Education is the most important, the most potent tool in fighting hatred and anti-Semitism. Congress recently passed the Never Again Holocaust Education Act to expand Holocaust education across the country because we know that the lack of such education in our K through 12 public schools directly translate into rising levels of anti-Semitism on college campuses and beyond. All too common 
are examples of faculty members and student leaders in the United States and European universities who directly challenge Jewish students. Not long ago, a candidate for student council at UCLA was disqualified for student council at UCLA merely because she was Jewish. This served to spotlight what appears to be a surge of hostile sentiment directed against Jews on campuses in the country. Criticism of the government of Israel and its policies has blurred into blatant prejudice against Jews around the world. This phenomenon must be stopped before entire generations grow up to become bystanders to indifference and apathy, or worse yet, participants in, <coughs> excuse me, in acts of division, hatred, and even violence. Imagine if every middle school student in this country had a unit in their world history class that read and discussed the diary of Anne Frank. Anne was only 13 years old when her family was forced into hiding from the Nazis. Yet she had the courage and the foresight to record what their lives were like in that crowded and cramped attic. As we tragically lose the last generation of Holocaust survivors, Anne's first-hand account of the horrors of persecution, Anne's truth, become an even greater legacy. Shortly after the shocking, hurtful attack on the kosher supermarket in Paris in 2015, I set out to reestablish and expand on the Congressional Anti-Semitism Task Force that Tom Lantos and then Congressman Mike Pence started. A large bipartisan group of members, in fact, more than 100 members each year, committed to coming together with renewed focus on combating anti-Semitism and educating our colleagues and world leaders. Among the many things we did was sponsor legislation to elevate the State Department's special envoy for monitoring and combating anti-Semitism to the rank of ambassador. As you know, President Biden has announced the appointment of Deborah Lipstadt. She is a historian, an expert on Jewish and Holocaust studies at Emory University in Atlanta, as our next U.S. ambassador to combat and monitor anti-Semitism. Frankly, many of us know her, work with her, and I cannot imagine a more qualified person to serve in this incredibly important position. I am certain that Dr. Lipstadt will work relentlessly and with the full backing of the State Department and the Congress, our leaders that you met today, to combat the resurgence of global anti-Semitism and prioritize the safety and security of Jewish communities around the world. In fact, 
I have to say. <laughs> I, in fact, doubled one of my last <laughs> things that I did. I doubled the special envoy's budget in my last appropriations bill before I retired. I knew no one would complain about that, so in case you didn't notice it, you can brag about it. Um, defeating the scourge of anti-Semitism will take partners, policy changers, and additional resources, but thankfully, Ambassador Lipstadt will be well positioned to make real progress. So despite all the reasons for pessimism and despair, ultimately the voices working to combat anti-Semitism are today far louder and more numerous than those promoting it. Look at my colleagues who are here, many who I can't see way back there, many who I know are working on this issue. If I can impart one piece of advice to those who carry on this fight, it is always seek out the broadest coalition of voices even if you do not agree on every aspect. Find ways to work together through compromise and an open mind. As a former, oh, I can't believe it, I guess, as a former, I still feel like it, <laughs> 10, and, okay, as a former member of Congress and as a Jewish woman, wife, mother, and grandmother. I am so humbled to accept this deep honor. So thanks to all of you who are here today and to those who wanted to but couldn't be. Thank you for your passion, your devotion to the causes about which we all care so much deeply. Thank you very much. ovations. <laughs> Although my husband, I'm very fortunate, if, in case you don't know Steve Lowy, he's been... <laughs> he's been a great supporter and I have several members, you don't mind if I ad lib a little bit, of my wonderful staff. Why don't you just stand up and wave? again to so many friends, so many people who are here today with whom I have not had the conversation. I don't know what's happening next, but I look forward to continuing the dialogue and I thank my colleagues who were here for all you did, all you were doing, and all you will continue to do. Thank you very much.